that. Let me just um, let me just uh, thank you all for being here. Um, I know that a lot of us um, would really uh, uh, like to have a an in person component, but uh, again, we're not quite there. I I hope that uh, by spring we'll figure out a way to do this both in person and streaming. I'm sure with Trice's guidance we, we will, and I want to thank him as always for setting this up. Um, uh, I want to let you know that um, we have uh, a, several events coming up in the next uh, next uh, month or so, especially in October, we have our annual film festival, um, which again, we like to do in person, but this year we're going to do it via Zoom. The host is going to be our visiting um, Israel Institute teaching fellow, Dr. Hadas Kohn, uh, starting uh, next Thursday night. Uh, that's right, next Thursday night in the three, uh, for three subsequent Thursday evenings, we're going to show a couple of three contemporary Israeli films. The first one is the only one I've seen, uh, Zero Motivation, FS Motivatia, very funny film about um, not very ex excited girls who are serving their time in the Israeli army. I can't tell you about the next two films after that. Um, I can say that Hadass is also going to be giving the November Just Lunch uh, on her research, which is about treason and traitors and how the Israeli judiciary has dealt with that, with a strong, uh, a strong gender component, which is one of her areas. Uh, Hadass has a degree both in history, a PhD both in history and also a legal degree. So her, her research is really on the intersection of, uh, of history and law, very interesting stuff. And uh, then in December, our, 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 our good friend, mm -hmm. uh, Karen Schutcher is speaking about uh, a, a book uh, or a short story actually called The Jew and the Thorn, uh, which uh, is uh, really in her field of German Jewish and German literature. And uh, we're looking forward to that. And then I think I've probably told most of you many times, um, but I'll tell you one last time until next time, uh, in the spring, we're uh, doing even more things, uh, including um, uh, our annual YKS lecture given by Elon Stevens, who's a great scholar of Latin American uh, uh, literature, uh, Jewish and otherwise. Uh, we're having uh, David Kaufman speak on his new book or new-ish book, The Jews, Indians. We're doing this in collaboration with uh, Native American Studies here and Native American Studies and Jewish Studies at UT Austin. So we're hoping to have David on Zoom and two groups live celebrating uh, this pretty important book. And then finally, near the end of March, we're also doing a, uh, we're also hosting the Western Jewish Studies Association. It will be only the second time that the Western Jewish Studies Association has been in the Southern Plains. Uh, the first time was in San Antonio and now in Norman. So we have quite a lot going on this year. I hope spring semester will be live as well as on Zoom. Okay, um, I, I see some, maybe some people are still getting on, but I'm gonna share my screen. And uh, again, thank you all for being here. I'm glad to see uh, people from, uh, again, Jacob, uh, Jeffrey, or. Uh, MA student, uh, indefatigable MA student from Israel, and some people from the West Coast are here, and uh, OKC, and of course my good colleagues here in Norman are here too, and my sister from New York, I believe. So, uh, let me share this screen, and uh, let's see. Let me just do... And uh, assuming everybody can see that okay. If you're, uh, if you're not a historian, uh, I think, I hope you'll enjoy this talk as an urban travelogue uh, to five interesting Jewish cities. Uh, let's call this uh, Jewish antiquity on $5 or five drachma a day. Uh, uh, unlike uh, Rick Steves, I can't walk you through them, not only because it's a uh, 
global pandemic, but also you can't really stroll through the past as if it were the present. Um, I do make a historiographical uh, contribution here, but that won't be apparent till the last slide or two. Uh, I want to uh, 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 I acknowledge that this uh, talk is uh, based on a se secondary sources, and uh, it's a sort of in preparation for a paper that I'm going to be giving uh, for my first in-person conference in two years in a couple of weeks. So I would really uh, love during the Q&A to get your feedback where you think I need to sharpen up uh, my presentation. Uh, I also want to acknowledge that my uh, focus here is top down. Although socioeconomic conditions were necessary for these five cosmopolitan cities to flourish, I'm mainly interested in the literary record. So um, enough apologies, and uh, let, me, uh, let me proceed here. Um, few terms are really self-explanatory, certainly not city or Jewish, but I will focus on the third term uh, in my title, cosmopolitan. Uh, you do not need vodka and cranberry juice for this talk, uh, although uh, it may help. Um, by, by cosmopolitan, um, uh, I mean not insular, a common model for Jewish communities historically. All five of the cities we will visit are characterized by wide variety and a large number of intellectual products. By cosmopolitan, I also mean a city that has had extensive and occasionally positive interactions between Jews and non-Jews and an occasionally sympathetic majority. By cosmopolitan, I mean diaspora Jewish cities. Tel Aviv today is a cosmopolitan city, but the features I'm interested in are, are, are diasporic. Uh, by cosmopolitan, I don't mean what scholars call a metropole uh, in colonial studies, uh, because uh, my last city, New York, isn't a capital, and because these cities didn't necessarily have colonies the way uh, the term metropole is usually used today. So this slide lists five positive criteria, size, age, language, works, and politics. I have other criteria that will emerge in the talk, but I'm not gonna put them all up here. So our first stop is Alexandria, and Alexandria specifically in the time of Cleopatra. Uh, Alexandria, as the name suggests, could claim to be the capital of the Hellenistic world. Founded around 330 BCE, Alexandria, not Cairo, was the capital of the Ptolemaic successors to Alexander of Macedonia, all the way to Cleopatra, the last autonomous ruler before the Emperor Caesar Augustus made Egypt Rome's personal property. Alexandria was a port city, a commercial city, above all, a huge city with a population placed at between 500,000 and 1 million, certainly the largest in the Roman Empire. Alexandria naturally attracted immigrants, including lots of Jews. Diana Delia, in Alexandrian citizenship, estimates there were around 180,000 Jews, possibly around a third of the total population. They did not seem to occupy a specialized place in the economy. Most of Alexandria's Jews lived near the palace, most spoke Greek, they comprised a distinct ethnic and religious community with a distinct neighborhood and enjoyed quasi-citizenship, isopoliteia, I probably butchered that Greek, uh, and who attracted detract and, and they attra had detractors and they had defenders. Many Alexandrian Jews probably migrated from the Nile River, the Elephantini settlement, a soldier settlement which had been founded in the fifth century BCE. But the Jews of Alexandria weren't considered native Egyptians nor Macedonians, and they didn't consider themselves that way either. There were about 200 cities. Uh, 200 Jewish communities attested in the Hellenistic Roman diaspora, including Antioch and Rome, but Alexandria was first among equals. The cultural creativity of Alexandria is difficult to quantify, mainly because we don't know where much of Second Temple Judaic literature was written. Probably a great deal was written in Alexandria, including the Septuagint, 
the first Greek, tra Greek, Greek translation of the Bible, the romance of Asenat and Joseph, third Maccabees, the letter of Aristeus, which explains how the Septuagint was translated, and many other works, at least a few of them, in the genre of pathetic history. One writer we're sure of was an Alexandrian Jew is Philo. This highly influential philosopher and innovator of the allegorical method of biblical interpretation, we know was an Alexandrian because he represented the Jewish community of Alexandria on a delegation to the emperor Caligula to intervene between Jews, ethnic Egyptians, and the Roman legate Flaccus. He wrote about this and he wrote about much more besides. If the second temple literature influenced the New Testament and Christianity more directly than Judaism, certainly in the case of the Septuagint, we know that to be the case, and in the case of Philo, who is critically important to Origen and the other allegorical philosophers of early Christianity, even if that influence was more directly impact, impactful on uh, Christianity, there's certainly evidence that later on, Philo's heirs, as my colleague Luis Cortes puts it, Aquinas and Maimonides, knew of Philo's work or knew of Philo's commentators, and that this also exerted a great influence on medieval Jewish and medieval Christian philosophy alike. In any case, for my argument, it's good enough to say that Philo certainly was highly influential in his own day and beyond the Jewish world alone. To those who would dismiss Hellenistic Jewry as merely Greek or merely a sideshow, this is really, uh, I think, uh, quite uh, indefensible. And uh, the, uh, uh, the successes of Alexandrian Jewry are pretty hard to argue with. They never attained the heights politically that they had under Cleopatra the Great, who, and the Jews were very supportive in her civil wars, uh, uh, and uh, there's no doubt that after Cleopatra in the Roman era, uh, political situation deteriorated. In 38 CE, there was a clash between Jews and non-Jews. During the great revolt against Rome, there was another clash in Alexandria. And finally, in 115 through 117, a third uh, revolt uh, uh, among Jews and non-Jews. But Alexandrian Jewry didn't disappear. It just remained stagnant until the Muslim conquest, and then it made a revival. There's nothing ephemeral about either Alexandrian Jewry or about the cosmopolitan Jewish cities that I'm going to take you to next. Our second stop is in Cordova in the 10th century. And Cordovan Jewry was a uh, really uh, under Abdel Ahraman III, a stand-in not just for Cordova, but for Seville and Granada and the whole region of Southern Spain called Andalus. These urban centers were geographically controlled, modest, they were walled cities, and they were ringed about by grain fields, olive trees, and vineyards, much as they are today. Cordova's population estimates, again, vary widely. Uh, uh, Maria Rosa Menucal, in her wonderful book, Ornament of the World, puts the city's population at 100 to 400,000. That's quite a range, with Jews comprising maybe a tenth, maybe a quarter of that population. As in Alexandria, there was a distinct Jewish neighborhood. Jews spoke Arabic, but they also spoke the uh, uh, either late language or early Spanish. Some people call it Hispano Romance, others Andalusa Romance, the sort of in between Latin and modern Spanish language. And for literature, of course, Jews used uh, Hebrew. This would be a, a constant in Jewish culture, except for Alexandria. Alexandria was the one example today that I'm going to talk about that was not Hebraic at all. Everybody in Alexandria that was a Jewish writer or cultural producer use Greek, and it was also pre-rabbinic. All the other examples are not. For about a century, the situation of Cordovan Jewry was uh, excellent. Cordovan Jews served as generals, courtiers, as well as the more usual professions of physician, 
in merchants, in farmers, uh, agriculturalists. There was really a very wide range of Jewish uh, occupations in Cordova, as in Alexandria. And the most famous Cordovan, let's see if this works, it does a little, uh, is Ibn uh, Hasta Ibn Shaprut, who was a Renaissance man before the ter term was coined. Uh, he led a delegation on behalf of the Umayyad emperor to Damascus. Uh, he was a trained physician, but like many power brokers, uh, 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 turned his interest to supporting and sponsoring poets, grammarians, uh, 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 secularists, astronomers, mathematicians. Hastai ibn Shaprut was really one of the uh, people who uh, uh, everyone mentions when they, when they write about the Spanish Golden Age. Uh, uh, one feature of uh, Cordova in this era, uh, and that becomes true of Jewish cosmopolitan cities, is that they become a magnet for talent. And so Maimonides, who was born in Cordova, always proudly signs his name, Maimonides from, uh, from Spain, Sephardi. Yehuda Halevi traveled from the north to the south. Uh, he, he, said he spent some time in Malaga, which was part of the Cordovan, uh, Cordovan uh, Caliphate at the time. And so what happened was these uh, cosmopolitan cities become magnets for Jews elsewhere in the settled world to come and, uh, and, and live, much as modern day cities are extremely attractive to people who are born in more or rural or suburban places. Uh, the, my favorite example from uh, Cordova uh, and, uh, or Al-Andalus Al more generally, uh, my favorite example of convivencia is not Ibn Shaprut, though he's certainly the most famous, but somebody a little bit later, one century later, Solomon Ibn Gavirol. Uh, Ibn Gavirol was a poet, an ethicist, a philosopher. And I think the most interesting thing about him is his name was Latinized into Afasebron, and his originally Arabic composed work was Latinized into a book called Fons Vitae. And until the mid 19th century, he was considered by one and all to have been either a Christian or a Muslim Neoplatonic philosopher. Only in the late 19th century did a French scholar named Solomon Monk figure out that uh, uh, the original uh, manuscript uh, had clear signs that Avicebron was the same guy as Ibn Gavirol. By the way, um, for those of you who know Tel Aviv, you'll know that Ibn Gavirol is uh, the major thoroughfare or a major thoroughfare in that city. My point, by the way, is not that uh, we didn't get credit for this one. Uh, uh, this is not a member of the tribe contribution literature, uh, 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 a slap on the back. Uh, my point uh, is that uh, this is a real sign of the uh, cultural hybridity that existed at least for a couple of centuries in what uh, is called uh, Golden Age Spain. That may be a bit overblown, uh, convivencia, the idea that Jews, Christians, and Muslims all got together wonderfully well for a few centuries is probably a bit overblown as well. I won't get into that. But uh, there's one thing that uh, I think is uh, pretty clear, and that it's hard to imagine in a insular setting uh, this kind of mistake being made. Uh, in other words, the sages of Babylonia uh, really couldn't be confused for their Sassanian counterparts. And while uh, the Frenchman Rashi certainly influenced Christian Bible commentary profoundly, he was never mistaken for Andrew of St. Victor or Nicholas of Lyer in good measure because of the linguistic feature. Rashi didn't write in Latin. These folks wrote in Arabic or uh, sometimes in Hebrew when they were writing entre nous. The third cosmopolitan city, whoops, I never showed you that slide, excuse me. Uh, I'll just say in passing that Ibn, uh, that Ibn Shaprut also uh, uh, spent a lot of money bringing grammarians, poets, philosophers, and lawyers to Cordova to, uh, to create uh, some of the more important works, at least 
the beginning of modern Hebrew grammar as we know it, uh, started in uh, Cordoba. Uh, but I will not stop there. I'll move on to Amsterdam, which is my third stop, and we'll move ahead uh, about five centuries, six centuries, to Amsterdam in the 17th century, called Dutch Jerusalem by Salo Baron, uh, uh, one of the great 19th century, 20th century Jewish historians. Uh, Amsterdam was a newer community than most of the others described today. Cordova, for instance, and most of Spain have been settled by Jews since the Roman imperial period, and of course remained there until 1492. Uh, uh, and uh, yeah, Alexandria, as I, I already mentioned, has really was uh, settled by Jews pretty consistently from the Alexander's day up until the 1950s. Um, Amsterdam was more recent than that in its settlement. Uh, there was a famous commission in 1639 led by the great, uh, maybe the founder of international law, Hugo Grotius. And uh, Grotius argued in favor of allowing the Jews who had begun to settle in Amsterdam to stay there. Um, the Dutch Republic uh, in the 17th century, mid 17th century was at its uh, uh, apex. Uh, the Dutch Republic always had a precarious existence. There were the Habsburg uh, dynasty settled in Spain and in Austria who always wanted to reconquer uh, the Netherlands and make it part of the Habsburg empire again. Uh, there were at home royalists who didn't want a republic but wanted uh, uh, a king like every other nation, uh, an old biblical theme. Uh, and uh, there were also uh, Calvinists, uh, uh, hardcore Calvinists who didn't appreciate the religiously tolerant atmosphere uh, of the Dutch Republic. But for at least a few decades, uh, uh, Republican and tolerant it was. And um, uh, the Jewish community of Amsterdam at this point by the end of the 17th century is around 10,000, maybe divided evenly between Sephardic and Ashkenazic. Uh, ultimately, the Ashkenazic Jews from Eastern Europe overwhelmed the Sephardi population. Uh, these, these numbers are relatively modest compared to our other uh, cities, but uh, they bore a little bit more of the weight uh, than the numbers would suggest because they were largely concentrated in the Jewish neighborhood of Breistadt. Uh, and this is another feature that um, I think runs through the model of the cosmopolitan Jewish city. It's not that Jews uh, are uh, randomly uh, placed down, beamed down at like Star Trek into random places in these cities. They usually settle and congregate as neighborhoods and that's part of what gives a flavor to these cities at large, not just the Jewish dimension. So the Breistadt was known for its uh, affordable housing and, uh, uh, it, and for its openness to people who weren't Jewish. In other words, uh, the sort of the raffish folk could settle there. In this case, the raffish folk included maybe the greatest painter of all times, Rembrandt von Rinn, who uh, didn't have a lot of money uh, and was a terrible financial manager, but he lived among the Jews of Breistadt. And as, as you probably know, if you know Rembrandt at all, used a lot of Jewish models in his uh, oils and also had, uh, must have had, had lots of conversations with his Jewish neighbors uh, uh, because in his, his paintings uh, shows a very, very clear understanding of not only biblical scenes, but more revealingly of post-biblical Jewish uh, interpretations of these scenes and characters. That's a whole other talk, but I would uh, just recommend uh, on, this, on this point, if you're interested in Rembrandt's Jews, I, I, I recommend Stephen Nadler's book of the same name, which is just a fantastic uh, uh, journey into this phenomenon. Okay, uh, Amsterdam Jewry, uh, uh, if, if I've spoken of these uh, earlier Jewish uh, metropolitan cities as magnets for talent, I would emphasize in Amsterdam's case that it was also a noted exporter of talent. 
So to give you, I think, two really good examples, let me just back, toggle back a second. This fellow on the far left, uh, Isaac Aboab, uh, 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 it, he's born in Portugal. He flees Portugal as so many uh, as so many uh, uh, conversos and crypto Jews did, and then he winds up for a number of years serving as sort of the first rabbi in the Western Hemisphere, mainly in what we now call Brazil. And um, because, of course, there were many Portuguese speakers in Brazil. Brazil then, then he comes back. Uh, to the Netherlands, this fellow on the right is even more famous, though you probably, you may not have seen a picture of him, but if you know a little about Jewish history, you've certainly heard of Manasseh ben Israel. And Manasseh, Manasseh ben Israel, and I'll show you one more picture of him, he's very famous because he wrote to Oliver Cromwell and uh, petitioned Cromwell, interestingly enough, in French, uh, for the readmission of the Jews to England from uh, whence they had been expelled in 1290. And so this, neither Isaac Aboa nor uh, Manasseh ben Israel were successful, by the way. Uh, both of these efforts failed, but I don't think that's, that's the key here. I think the key here is that these figures um, really uh, got a hearing, not only in their native Amsterdam, uh, where there were very important figures in the city, not just the Jewish part, but the city generally, but also uh, got a hearing uh, uh, outside. And then, of course, we cannot um, uh, cannot leave Amsterdam at all without mentioning the most famous, everybody's famous heretic, excommunicate, uh, Baruch, Bento, Benedict Spinoza who of course grew up speaking Portuguese in, at home, reading Portuguese and Spanish, then learning Hebrew at the fabled uh, Amsterdam Jewish schools, which were known worldwide for their excellence. Then of course, in order to get a wider hearing in the world, wrote his major philosophical works in Latin and corresponded in a variety of languages to major figures in the intellectual world of 17th century Europe, including some very, very famous scientists like Robert Boyle and Christian Huygens and uh, the head of the uh, British Royal Academy. In other words, Dutch Jewry uh, for uh, these middle years of the 17th century was really just a piece of the, uh, the golden era of the Dutch Republic. And um, in in the sort of pushback to the idea that all of these were ephemeral, you know, ephemeral cities, I would just like to say that although it's true that Cordoba had its great moments and then declined and Amsterdam as well, there were more Jews living in Amsterdam in 1940 when the Nazis invaded than in 1640. Uh, so these, these cities were not ephemeral, uh, 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 ephemeral moments. They were really uh, of many hundreds years length in some cases. That was true of Alexandria as well. Our fourth stop is Vienna in the Fanza Siecla, the end of the 19th century. And uh, Vienna uh, was the capital city, obviously, of the uh, Austrian Empire, later the Austro-Hungarian Empire. It wasn't what, I don't think it's what scholars would call a metropole. It, it, it didn't have colonies. Its colonies were really the great crown lands uh, stretching from the Adriatic all the way to the Black Sea. And, um, uh, and this is where a lot of the Jewish population of Vienna came from, Galicia and Romania, Bulgaria, uh, Saloniki, this great Sephardic Jewish city that was uh, destroyed by the Nazis. And um, Vienna, like the rest of these cities, was itself quite large. Maybe the population uh, in 1910 stood at around 2 million total, and the Jewish population uh, approximately 170,000. Uh, on the continent, only Warsaw and Budapest had larger Jewish populations. Uh, by 1910, uh, New York City, the last place we'll visit, 
far outstripped every other, uh, every other Jewish city by population. In Vienna, the population, the Jewish percentage of the population hovered around eight to 10 percent. But once again, that was uh, uh, that effect was heightened by the fact that, that there were very distinct Jewish neighborhoods in what was called the inner city and Leopoldstadt. And this was where um, a large number of the Jews lived before 1914. Uh, and in the same way that the Scheunenviertel in Berlin, before and after the First World War, you could say, if you wanted to see Jewish Berlin, this would be maybe the first place to go. Uh, I won't bring Berlin in because we have enough examples. I'll say this about the political situation. It was better than the Pale of Settlement but uh, under the czars, but fundamentally ambivalent. So it's an oddity of Viennese culture, I think, that on the one hand, you have a cultural, artistic, journalistic left wing in which Jews and non-Jews, aristocrats and commoners collaborated and interacted in an enor to an enormous extent. But on the other hand, you have uh, Vienna electing the first um, uh, ardently anti-Semitic mayor. I'm sure there were other mayors with anti-Semitic sentiments, but Karl Lueger was the first one who actually put anti-Semitism in the heart of his appeal to the Viennese voters. And he was returned a number of times, uh, the first time at least, maybe the first two times, I forget exactly, uh, Emperor Franz Joseph didn't want to seat him. Uh, ultimately, he had no choice. Um, the, uh, the uh, well, I better go back one step. I think you know most of these people. That's Ma Gustav Mahler, the great, uh, uh, the, the great composer, Theodor Herzl, the father of political Zionism, of course, Sigmund Freud. Uh, this uh, woman you may not have seen quite as often, but I hope you have. Her name was Berta Pappenheim. Uh, she was a, a Viennese Jew who became a uh, very important feminist figure. She founded the Jewish Women's League, Jüdische Frauenbund, uh, and she also was a, a terrific uh, writer and translator. She uh, translated from Yiddish into German uh, uh, the uh, uh, memoirs of uh, her ancestor, Glukul of Hamon. Uh, in any event, uh, all of these folks, and I really can't emphasize this enough, were multilingual um, as uh, the Jews of Holland were and the Jews of uh, Cordova were. Uh, 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 Herzl, Theodor Herzl, for instance, knew Magyar, a uh, Hungarian from his growing up, 18 years in Budapest. Uh, Freud knew much more Yiddish than he liked to admit. Uh, his Yiddish was actually uh, perfect. And people who've written about Freud say his mother actually spoke Yiddish, not German at home. Uh, so he was really a native level Yiddish speaker, though again, he didn't like to admit it. Uh, and most of the Jews, who migrated from Galicia, Romania, Bulgaria, Staloniki, spoke some combination of the vernacular plus Yiddish and plus German. And that was the language, uh, the language uh, of the ruling class. Uh, I might uh, just say that uh, one of the features of um, modernity for the Jews uh, has been secular, the creation of secular vehicles to preserve Jewish identity. In other words, as Jews modernized, a lot of the religious components of Jewish, of Judaism fell away, but that didn't mean there weren't other things that took its place. Community organizations, newspapers, Jewish in general, and in fact, the new free press of, of Vienna, Neue Freie Presse, was owned by a couple of Jews who, by the way, employed as a, a lead columnist, Theodore Herzl, but refused to report on Zionism until his death. Uh, they didn't want to give Zionism any free press because they were so anti-Zionistic. Um, but uh, in addition to all these modern organizations, uh, which are really characteristic of the cosmopolitan Jewish city, I would just say it's really not much of an argument to me that I don't really need to make that uh, much of what we call um, much of what we call modernist culture was the product 
of a liberal Viennese, Viennese Jewish milieu. And uh, except for the plastic arts, if we're talking about literature, uh, if we're talking about uh, music, if we're talking about um, if we're talking about journalism, if we're talking about most areas of cultural creativity, certainly psychoanalysis analysis and others were um, the product of Jewish and non-Jewish interaction, which is the single feature of the cosmopolitan Jewish city that I think is most important. Okay. Um, my fifth stop, I think we're gonna have to get on the, uh, the rapid subway uh, here to get through uh, New York uh, 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 quite as quickly as I had anticipated. Um, the fifth stop in New York in the 20th century, uh, I'll hit some of the major categories quickly, and then I'll do a very fast decade by decade overview, and then we'll take some questions. So obviously size is the first factor that you have to mention when you're talking about a city and a cosmopolitan city. And I will just say that uh, by, for most of the 20th century, New York was the largest Jewish city in the world. Usually a third to a half of uh, American Jewry lived in the New York City metropolitan area. Uh, for some of those decades, especially before the Second World War, Jewry actually constituted the single largest ethnic group within New York City's borders. There were still Jewish neighborhoods in every borough that I know of except Staten Island. I haven't been able to confirm any with any of my any friend. I don't have any friends from Staten Island. Maybe that's maybe that tells you that's the problem right there. Not that I have anything against it. Uh, uh, along with size, antiquity counts. Uh, in North America, at least, uh, there have been Jews living in New York since 1654. I think antiquity matters for a sense of home, feeling at home, what uh, in German is called Heimat. Uh, but it's certainly been characteristic of the cities we're speaking of. Language, primarily English, obviously, but uh, let's not forget that for the first half of the 20th century, uh, there was no greater capital of Yiddish publishing, or for that matter, of Hebrew publishing in the diaspora than New York City. Uh, the major, uh, the major, uh, uh, Yiddish newspapers, uh, and I, I was going to get to this, I'm not sure I will, uh, enjoyed circulations of, in the case of the forward, the most widely circulated, 275,000 newspapers were sold daily. And if you uh, understand the economics of the immigrant community, that means we don't even know how big the readership was because a lot of times these Yiddish newspapers were read around the family table. Uh, Along with Yiddish and Hebrew, uh, there was also a whole variety of uh, flourishings in a variety of areas that um, really give uh, not New York its, uh, it, it, not only New York its character, but which I think make a general imprint on 20th century American culture. So let me, let me do a very, very quick, uh, decade by decade kind of review or area by area review. I won't, I won't, I clearly don't have time to get into this at length, but, and I'm also clearly don't have time to enter into the kind of academic question that I'm, you know, is really not answerable. What makes any of this Jewish? But let me just quickly, it always takes longer when you actually do it out loud rather than to yourself at home. Isn't that amazing? So uh, let me just say that if we're going to consider immigrant literature significant, and I think we should, um, as an American form, we have Mary Anton. I let her in even though she went to Boston. I'm not gonna hold that against her. Her, uh, her more prolific contemporary, Angie Yazurka, uh, was a, uh, lived on the Lower East Side most of her life. Abe Kahan, the editor of the Forward, also wrote in English, in the Atlantic Monthly and other very famous news uh, uh, journals. Uh, by the way, so did many non-Jews like Hutchins Hapgood, Norman Hapgood, Jacob Reese, a little more ambivalently to explain the New York City ghetto to everyone. And of course, the most famous voice 
of America's openness to the immigrant remains New York City's native Emma Lazarus. Uh, again, I'll be very fast here, faster than I should be, uh, uh, but we can go back if you have some time for questions and answers. Uh, I, I, I will, I'm not going anywhere today, but maybe you have to rush off for class. Um, uh, Tin Pan Alley, uh, certainly you can't understand um, Tin Pan Alley without understanding, let's say, either Irving Berlin, the uh, remarkable prodigy who couldn't read music himself, but who uh, could apparently write a song uh, every hour and did so for 40, 50 years, uh, including, of course, God Bless America, which was his true religion, much more than Judaism and much more than, uh, I think it was Episcopalianism, he eventually converted to some Christian denomination. You can't convert to Americanism if he could have, he would have. Uh, then, of course, at the other end, from people who couldn't read music, like Berlin, and really uh, weren't quite, it's almost idiot savants at the, at the keyboard, you have people like Ira and George uh, Gershwin, who certainly rank among the more sophisticated members of Tim Pin Alley, though that's where they got their start. And the same passage from pop culture to high culture, you also find uh, on the Broadway stage. As far as I know, Rodgers and Hammerstein never visited Oklahoma. They sure wrote the musical uh, before Rodgers uh, paired up with Hammerstein. Uh, he was paired up uh, with, uh, uh, with uh, Hart. Uh, and, uh, and there too, uh, you know, uh, after the Second World War, uh, Leonard Bernstein was probably the most famous figure uh, in uh, not just New York, but I would say probably in the United States in terms of popularizing classical music. And I say popularized without any stigma. Let's say a, be let's say a better way of putting it, making uh, classical music accessible and enjoyable for a larger audience uh, than the upper crust that had previously enjoyed it. Uh, the story of New York Jewry uh, uh, obviously continues. Um, the New York uh, intellectuals, the subject of uh, my, uh, uh, my dear colleague, Professor Ronnie Grimberg's work, uh, uh, were, uh, uh, were not all Jewish. They were not all Judaically learned. They were not all American born, but certainly people like uh, Hannah Arendt or uh, uh, Lionel and Diana Trilling, or uh, uh, Irving Howe, uh, certainly uh, would have to be included as uh, members of this publicly engaged intellectual group uh, that would go uh, also go for the neoconservative wing of it, or what became the neoconservative wing, people like Norman Pod Horitz and Midge Dechter. Uh, they were, uh, inarguably important. They certainly thought so. Uh, and uh, subsequent scholars have agreed. And some have even called them the last American intelligentsia. Finally, uh, in terms of panels, and I know uh, I'm uh, pushing the clock here, uh, but uh, bear with me a few more minutes. Um, second wave feminism in America, I think would be pretty hard um, to uh, uh, describe adequately without the names of New York born or New York migrated Jews, including Bella Abzug, the great Bronx bomber, or Gloria Steinem, who came from Ohio, but had the good sense to move to Manhattan, or of course, the Brooklyn uh, notorious RBG. Uh, all of these feminist icons, by definition, rejected patriarchal tenets of traditional Judaism, but to read them out of Jewish history on those grounds would leave most modern Jews on the outside as well. And that is clearly an incoherent result. History draws in Venn diagrams, and we have an interesting history of Jewish feminism that's been very well told by others. What I would highlight here is not Jewish feminism, but the fact that American feminism was deeply influenced by these Jewish figures. Okay, uh, let me uh, uh, 
so what? Uh, always a fair question. Uh, before I answer it, and I'm on my penultimate slide, let's just review what we found very quickly. And anyone who wants this, anyone who'd like this PowerPoint, uh, just write me and I'll happily send it to you. <clears throat> Size matters, absolute and proportional. The antiquity of settlement matters. Political status, at least relative to that era, matters. Jewish neighborhoods seem to be a feature of the cosmopolitan Jewish city. The reach beyond the metropole, uh, these cities all exported talent. Magnet for provincials to the metropole. Most of these cities seem to have imported talent from the larger area they uh, dwelt in. Polyglotism, with the exception of Alexandria, all of these cities had Jews living in them who generally spoke the language of the land, spoke a Jewish language, often a vernacular Jewish language, like Yiddish or Judeo-Arabic, and then often also used Hebrew, especially for uh, literary uh, purposes, letters, tracts on specifically Jewish issues, poetry, and so forth. The attitude of non-Jews, I would say, what characterizes all of these cosmopolitan cities is that not everybody hated the Jews, okay? Of course, some people did, but also there were large segments of people who did not and who collaborated with Jews in a variety of venues. I didn't give enough time to that. I would have, could have given more. And then finally, I would just emphasize that the decline in all of these cases was not rapid. These were not just Johnny come lately spur of the moment things that popped up and have disappeared. Most of these cities lasted a few hundred years, sometimes longer than that, and continued to uh, uh, be important both before and after their moments of cultural efflorescence. Okay, uh, one last thing, uh, and here I don't wanna get too academic, so I won't, um, I'll just say, why would I bother to talk about this and rely on secondary scholarship and overreach so badly to talk about all these places that I'm not an expert in and I'm not? Uh, uh, and I'll just tell you three quick reasons and then I'll stop my screen share and, and hopefully we can talk about it a little bit. Um, first, I just want to emphasize the fate of cosmopolitan and insular Jewish cities. I think there's a default mechanism that thinks the more insular and Jewish and uninvolved, the better, and the better the chances of Jewish survival. I just don't think that's true. I don't think it's supported by the evidence. And so I want to make a case for these cosmopolitan Jewish cities as a permanent feature and an important one and a positive one. Another, a second point is just, this is just another way to cut the cake. You can talk about diaspora and homeland. You can talk about gender. You can talk about ethno-geographical categories like Ashkenazi and Sephardi or even intellectual styles. But I would say cosmopolitan and insular is another worthwhile dichotomy. What kind of city are we talking about when we're talking about, or what kind of place are we talking about when we're talking about Jews? And then my final point, and then I'll, I, We'll unscreen share. My final point today is one I wouldn't have had to make 10 years ago when I first started thinking about this topic. And even though I'm, I'm looking forward to presenting it again, I've been thinking about it a long time. 10 years ago, um, the idea that there is such a thing called Jewish history wouldn't have needed much of a defense. Um, but we're in a really nominalistic moment in academia where everything is broken down into its smallest pieces. And uh, a lot of people would say to understand Jewish history, all you need to understand is that particular setting, that particular place, that particular time, and its immediate environment. And there's nothing more to Jewish history than that. Just a series of dots. Uh, if you want to read a good book on this, Moshe Rothman's How Jewish is Jewish History is a good, uh, a good example. And all I can say here is that uh, Rothman, I'm on Rothman's page here. I think there is a meaningful 
construct Jewish history, even if it's only that Jews think of themselves as Jews and that that in itself becomes a useful way of thinking about a historical set of issues. Okay, well, let me thank you all for coming. Thank you for paying uh, so much attention to a rather longer talk than I had thought it was. And um, uh, uh, I hope to see you uh, uh, either Thursday evening coming up soon for the film festival or next month uh, when uh, Professor Hadas Cohen will be speaking. So thank you very much and take care.